Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got the Beat, the podcast devoted to teen entertainment from the 80s and beyond. I'm your host, Michael, and Mindy's on the other side. Yo. <laughs> uh, this episode, we're just going to see two movies with kids trying to go to space in one way or another. Uh, Explorers and October Sky and... Huh. You know, this is the part of the show where someone might get mad at me, but I don't think Explorers is very good. <laughs> Oh, well, you saw, I had sent you a message while I was watching it, right? And I was like, this is kind of boring. <laughs> you know, I mean, we went and saw this in the theaters. I remember. Do you remember seeing it in the theater? Of course not. Oh. We had this discussion uh, privately. Or, did we have it on the last episode where you said you went to follow that bird first? I really thought I did, yes. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure this came out like a month before Follow That Bird as well. But I'm just thinking about all the movies around that time. We saw so many to drive in the theater or whatever. So I can see why you would forget because you weren't... Well, you first off, you don't have like that kind of memory with movies. But you have you actually know family members' names and friends. I don't. <laughs> I don't know my co-workers' names. I know. Have I know. My brain has a lot of details in it. And there's things like... Um, I don't know if it's because I'm not the type of person that likes to names of movies actors oh and i watch them and i'm like oh yeah isn't that the guy from this and like like i have that kind of stuff in my head like i can remember like you know so many things about movies or actors or like connect things but i mean i was like five years old who, yeah i mean who remembers things very vividly it's i think that's kind of rare well yeah i was thinking about i was in 1983 i was five no, 1982 I was five. In 1985 I was eight, and that's a big difference in your like uh, capacity. Yeah, your cognitive yeah. like uh, be able to recall things a little bit thoroughly. I don't remember what theater we saw this in, but I do remember we went and saw it. Um, and I thought for some reason for years I thought this was a big hit. I didn't realize this is just another one of those movies that in the 80s they sold to HBO dirt cheap. Or Showtime mm-hmm. or whatever. It played a million times. It did really well on video. And that's why it has such a huge following. That really doesn't happen oh. that much anymore. But it seemed like it was very common back then. You find out later, you're like, that movie tanked? Everybody I know saw this. Yeah, you know, I I don't actually remember very much about this movie. I remember the main kid, three kids. I remember them building their, you know ship whatever you want to flying saucer whatever you want to call it and and flying kind of you know when they were zipping around in it and got like went by the drive-in and all that stuff but i don't honestly didn't don't remember much more of it and i was just like oh this happened okay cool and like and like all the other people and the parents are like well shit those people have been you know character actors since the beginning of time apparently well and I remember, I think it was about 10 years ago, I had brought up this movie in, in some discussion or whatever. And you're like, oh, I love that movie. And I was like, I should watch that again. And I had seen it. I think I got it from the library or something. And I was like, oh, oh, the structure of this yeah. doesn't really work for me that well. And I was yeah. like, I don't really. I mean, Joe Dante may be my favorite director. He's really, he's definitely in my top three. It rotates between John Carpenter, Walter Hill, and Joe Dante. Joe Dante, I think, has had the fewest amount of disappointments. And even though I would say this is one of his very low, like, last on the list, I still say, like, if this is his worst, (laughs) that's a miracle considering what a lot of directors go through. But it's also a movie, if people don't know, that was severely compromised from the beginning. That it's one of these movies where, I mean, think about this. You're coming off Gremlins. And that's like one of the biggest hits of one of the greatest summers ever. In 1984, you you got like Karate Kid, Ghostbusters, uh, uh, Temple of Doom, and, and, and all sorts of like really great movies that summer. And Gremlins is one of the top three. That's amazing. And he said it was the first time anybody really came to him with a project instead of like him him having to develop a project for a long period of time. You know, and having someone else, big name like Spielberg, whatever, have to, you know, help get him hired, that kind of thing. And he liked the idea. And it had already been offered to Wolfgang Peterson, who had just come off of uh, Never Ending Story. And 
But Wolfgang Peterson insisted on shooting it in Germany. Paramount didn't want that. So uh, he went off to go do Enemy Mine with Luke Gossett Jr. and Dennis Quaid while they offered it to Joe Dante. And he's like, it just appealed to my interest. And he knew, like, the... So, yeah, I can see that, uh, like, he why he'd want to do it. Because, you know, he's a big 50s sci-fi movie buff. And this had a lot of, like, love letter stuff to it. And he said the third stru- uh, third act or whatever was never really complete. But Paramount yeah. really wanted to rush the production. And he said, like, he would be on set. And the cement wasn't even dry from the, the set pieces that the kids' feet were sinking into. And the paint was still wet. That's how fast they pushed it. But then... He's like, well, we didn't have the third act done. We thought we had time. So they were literally like just improving, you know, improvising the script as they were going towards the end. That's why it's kind of a chaotic mess. And even then, when uh, they thought they had like six more weeks of editing to do, and Paramount says, well, we wanted to release this in August, but we changed our mind and we want to release it at, I think it was mid-June or uh, early July. And so that stripped them of time to put the movie together. They said they left so much footage behind because they just didn't have the time. They wanted more, um, like, a, a discussion of metaphysical. You know that stuff with the interlinking dreams and, you know, their, that mind thing? Yeah. That he said he, yeah. there was a big chunk of that exploration that was left on the floor that would have, he said, that, you know, made it more than just a kid's fantasy. Like, it had something to really say. Yeah, I had questions about that that I feel were or explained at all. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, why did that girl have the same dreams as them, and why didn't they really explain it? Yeah, it's... I mean, the funny thing is that it was such a massive flop because they decided to open it the week after Back to the Future. Yeah, well. yeah it's just like they screwed themselves, and they maybe would have had a better movie. The movie was a huge flop. I mean, massive flop. Only made $9 million. And that's got to hurt going from 140 to 9 Yikes. Thing. You know, I'm reading, like, considering all the movies and stuff that he did direct, I'm looking at all the things he was, like, considered for, all the things that he almost directed. It's kind of bonkers. Yeah, did you read Jaws 3, People 0? It was National Lampoons was going to take over the franchise? <laughs> oh, God, that's funny. But, like, yeah, Jurassic Park. He was going to uh, do a Godzilla, I remember. That. He wanted to direct Batman. Uh, I forget. He was considered for some... Oh, Mommy. Oh, yeah. I remember. I, I listened to an interview where he was attached for years. There's... So the 80s World was... was not enough. All kinds of crazy stuff. He worked pretty consistently through the 80s. because So he did uh, The Howling, mm-hmm. then Twilight Zone, then Gremlins, this, Explorers... Uh, I want to say he did part of Amazon Women on the Moon, which is a, a, I think so, yeah. you know, a sketch comedy movie, Inner Space, um, The Burbs, and then it kind of started to go downhill because Gremlins 2 uh, cost a fortune compared to the first one, but it didn't make as much money. Uh, matinee bombed. And then there was that big gap where he was doing like TV. Oh, damn. Like, I love Matinee. We, we need to cover that. We should. Like, um uh, he was he, he did Erie, Indiana, which was his own. You know, uh, like, also love. Yeah, um, also that's what we should Looney do. Tunes that's that's back should... in action. What's that? I also love Looney Tunes back in action. I remember he was supposed to do the Phantom as well, but the studio had a different idea. They wanted to make it a really PG thir- uh, PG not PG thirteen kids movie, and mm-hmm. it just. And so he backed away from it. He still got producer on it, but he wasted so many years like trying to get that made. And so there's a big gap between Matinee and Small Soldiers. And then there was another big gap between that and Looney Tunes Back in Action. Now, I think his last two movies, it's kind of a shame that they were barely released. I get a little bit. Uh, what's the one uh, that Anton Yelkin was in? Um, my Bury the, Bury the X. Bury the X. Uh, that one is just because so low budget, but he did a movie called The Hole, uh, which was supposed to be theatrical. It was 3D. It's really scary and fun, and it just it just got thrown away. And, and I think that kind of and literally on Am- uh, on IMDb, it, there's literally no options to like where you can find it to watch it. Oh, I have it on Blu-ray. Thank goodness. Um, 
I'm just saying, like, that that's something to say about how much it was thrown away, you know? Yeah, yeah. I just, I, he's one of my favorite directors, and I just think, like, he's doing TV now, and TV's harder for a lot of directors because if you're cinematic in any way and you're not the guy doing the pilot where you have your own yeah. vision, you're just hired to do a quick shoot, it's got to hurt. Mm. It's got to hurt a little bit. Yeah, you're paying your bills, but your voice is gone, basically. Yeah. I don't know how he's got a lot of projects like in the works. If that makes you any better, I did not know that there was going to be a Gremlins TV series that he is directing. Yeah, I think it's an animated show. Actually, I can't remember. Oh, it is. It looks kind of cute, but I... oh, James Hong is going to do it. Oh, nice. Um, Explorers. Yeah, anyway. I, f- I feel like there's a lot left and i wish that he could have like the chance to you know get that old footage and put together the the version that he wanted to it's a cult following now and i can see somebody like yeah okay we'll we'll finance you know and make this like a special director's cut release that is if that material still exists which it's so old now i seriously doubt it does yeah yeah, it makes me so sad about stuff like that. It's just, like, gone forever, you know? Unless somebody has the, the forethought to... The wisdom to be like, no, no, I think this is something, you know? I need it to keep it. Yeah, I, I, think, so, I, think, so some, I think some directors know now and companies know that there's a secondary market after the initial release where audiences will be interested in an alternate cut, which is which became common like about 20 years ago when DVD was so huge. Yeah. Um, this is the director, or, no, sorry, acting debut of Ethan Hawke and River Phoenix. What are the chances of the three kids? One of them already has been in like four or five movies, and he basically had no career, and then the two that this is their first movie <laughs> ended up becoming big stars. Hey, you know... Charisma, you got it, you got it. Yeah, I mean, if you ask me, I would not have thought that this was their first. I thought, oh, yeah, these guys are pretty good for, you know, like 12, 13 right. year old. Agreed, yes. But yeah. they don't seem like they're cutting their teeth on this movie. <laughs> not at all. The uh, And uh, I think this is the debut of Amanda Peterson, who most people know from Can't Buy Me Love. Right, exactly. The um, I think the biggest part for me is A the logic behind how they build the little sphere that can, you know, travel, I think is completely ridiculous, but it was the 80s. And, you know, it's for kids, and you're not thinking a lot about the reality of this, but that's still, like, no, how did they even... You can't just create that with computers. <laughs> mm-hmm. And... Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, you know, the parents, his parents, and of like, like incredibly like insane household (laughs) is that super conducive to creativity or completely destructive who knows yeah i'm trying to remember now uh who were the parents i think what river phoenix's one was james cromwell right was his dad yes and i didn't realize yeah i was like oh he was acting even then wow and dana ivy was his mom that was dana ivy wow okay yeah, and I was like, damn, lady. That's what I'm saying. Like, those character actors, they were uh, they were around even, like, longer than I even imagined. Okay, and uh, who, who were uh, Ethan Hawke's parents? Mm, I don't remember it, them being around that much. Okay. Just, the, just his mom was... Mary Kay Place but his mom? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I think, but I don't, his, I don't think his, I think there was something about his dad and why he wasn't there, but I don't remember now. Anyway. The, um, there's a movie, there's a movie within the movie when they're at the drive-in. Yeah. And I, of course, at the time, I didn't know, but as a shitty film connoisseur, <laughs> I realized... Yeah, it's such a specific spoof. It's a spoof of the Italian ripoffs of Star Wars, where they clearly had no budget, and it was just like little ships on strings or sticks or whatever that would fly by the camera really quick. Oh. And the fact that all the people in the movie, their voices are dubbed. They're saying something different than what's actually being heard because it's supposed to be a, you know. Uh, there's a big one called Star Crash, which was a very expensive for Italy movie in 1978 
which is almost a note for note ripoff of Star Wars. And it has um, Christopher Plummer and um, David Hasselhoff. And it's cheesy. I, I kind of want to watch it. Is that disturbing? It's, it's no, it's a lot of fun. You should watch the uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 version of Star Crash. It's, oh, okay. That way you get cool, you know cool, the okay. joy of watching a shitty movie, but also poking fun at it at the same time. This is a this is a curse of '80s movies. Also, is that there's always seems to be the nerdy kid who is absolutely fucking bullied by these. You know, I keep thinking of like Monster Squad. You know, the the fat kid Horace. You know, his harassment yeah. or whatever. And River Phoenix, man, the kid just walks right up to him and rips his fuck the back of his pants off. I know. Horrifying. I, I'm sure, and that you know, kind of that kind of stuff kind of gets to you. I know. It's just hard. It's, it is really fucked. Yeah. I mean, I never got it that bad. I got my, you know, books knocked out of my hand on a regular basis, whatever, and shoved into lockers. For, but I never had anybody just, like, rip my ass. You <laughs> know, just, oh, there's your butt cheeks just sticking out. Well, underwear, but you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, it's, it's a very strange uh, and specific way to torture someone. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, like, there's really something wrong with that kid's brain. <laughs> Let's explore that. So... I think then special effects are pretty good for 1985. What astounds me is the makeup should not make me uncomfortable, but yet it does. I don't know if it's because mm-hmm. I saw this really young and it, it, it really creeped me out, but it's like this weird cartoonish clown in space. But there's something so outrageous about the design and disturbing that to this day it makes me a little nauseous. Is that odd? No, way. Like- the like aliens yeah the alien creatures they create something about it to me is nauseating and i cannot pin down why yeah no it's gross it's super gross and i also didn't remember any of that yeah i just think the ending they had what they said wasn't very cinematic but i also like this is cinematic but it's also not good though it's just like i mean it's like 25 minutes of the movie of these like I don't know what these teen aliens just trying to be humorous they've learned everything off TV so what this is not fun yeah it just felt like such a like wait like are you guys just trying to fill time because this is weird and boring yeah it's uh the build up meandering yeah the payoff for the build up was not good yeah agreed so yes I enjoy much more the like you know, the, them just building the machine and, like, flying around their town and stuff. Yeah. But once they got to the space part, I was just like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I would have been more interested if they had taken a more thriller angle instead of the wacky angle and that they're now being pursued by, like, NASA or, you know, the, yeah. the FBI yeah. or whatever. Or someone steals it and uses it for the wrong thing or whatever, and they have to clear their name. I don't know. It just felt like this should have been something more dramatic. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It, because it could definitely could have gone that route. But it... I don't know. I mean, if you're trying to elicit certain emotions, I don't think... It, it elicited very different emotions in me than you actually want. <laughs> yeah. Like, and... and- Joe Dante does have a problem sticking the landing when it comes to... I think he shies away from Sirius. Which is weird because one of his very first movies, I think, is the best werewolf movie ever made, The Howling. And that is very dramatic. It has some dark humor in it, but it's not wacky. And just after that, it feels like he was pulling his punches or he just wasn't interested in it. I would like to see him do some a real dramatic movie. Yeah, I feel like even the stuff that's a little bit more serious, like, I mean, Inner Space seems like maybe one of the more serious ones, still wasn't that serious. Yeah, well, like in The Burbs, when he, you go that whole time thinking one thing, they pull the the rug out from under you, which is cool, but then uh, in the ending, which was reshot, and I think the studio made them reshoot it, is like, you know, because do you remember, like, the neighbors actually did turn out to be, like, cannibal murderer or whatever they were? And I watched the original cut, and Joe Dante just didn't 
stick the landing and like you got to go reshoot this whatever and then it's it's still a little wacky but it's like oh these guys are real fucked up you know monsters and and like thank goodness because that made the movie so much better yeah i don't really remember a lot of stuff about that movie either uh i i think i need to go watch it again yeah that is an annual watch in my world um is there anything else you want to say about explorers before we go over to october sky not really now, October Sky is really, really fucking good. <laughs> I have no notes about how to make it better. <laughs> um, dear Lord, though, it is a visually a very bleak, depressing movie, which it needs to be to drive home the point that Homer and so many other people are desperate to get out of there, but so few people have the chance to get out. It's funny how so many of them just... Uh, uh, yeah, I guess I'll just go work in the mine. The thing that gets people killed all the time? Yeah, what else am I going to do? That's so depressing. But that's just like, that's just what they know. I mean, that's the whole entire, I mean, the town is owned by the mine. It's, you know, instead of, the you know, the other way around. Like, this town literally exists because of the mine. And, you know, the everything is owned by them other than the school, maybe. You know, their homes are owned by them. The grocery store, everything is, is part of the mine. And that is the entire reason their town exists and the purpose for all the people being there. Instead of just, you know, this is a place you live and, this, and thus you have a job, your entire existence is centered around this one thing. And I think that's something that, you know, like most people don't, don't understand and don't ever have to experience thank god yeah what a what a horrifying i mean i don't want to belittle like i I don't you know want to belittle the like difficulties and the the challenges and how difficult it was to be in that kind of environment but Thank God, like, that that's not something that we understand. Yeah, I mean, and there, it's not even that far away from where we grew up. I mean, Ohio and Pennsylvania have this. Indiana really, that's not their thing. Um, we don't have, I don't think we have yeah. any coal mines here. I don't, I've never been a coal miner, but that's no. literally like why, like you said, why certain towns even exist is because they found a place they could use to, you know, do mining or whatever and just built around that. And like so many other uh, cities over the decades, it, it's you know the mine has been depleted and the town shuts down. And I think it said that some company came in and just bought the town. Like they, they, you can just sell a town. <laughs> it's weird. I mean, I don't know what happened. To, I mean, I can't remember what it said, but the coal mine shut down and the whole yeah, the whole town just, just shut down in like what nineteen sixty four. And this movie took place in nineteen fifty seven I think so it wasn't even that many more years before you know their the reason that they were all there stopped existing what's insane to me is that for a century I think they probably wear masks now but I'm not sure well you're in this shit you can see it flying around as you're digging in and you didn't think you were inhaling it all like all of a sudden all these people were getting black lung disease and <laughs> it just still took decades for people to go should probably wear a mask and goggles yeah. Horrifying. Because that's what Homer's dad died of in real life. This is a true story, by the way, yeah. everybody. Uh, uh, if you didn't know that, you know, yeah. that he died of black lung in the 70s. And I'm just like, I'm shocked he even lived that long. I mean, so many people got killed in this movie or injured just yeah. because you're... I could never do it because I'm claustrophobic. Can you imagine climbing down miles and miles into no, that it, dark... It, it, it is truly... It truly sounds like my personal hell. Yeah. For many reasons. Um, I think this is Jake Gyllenhaal's first starring role. I know he had been in a few movies before that. Am I wrong? Is this the first thing? I mean, I'm pretty sure it was. He did some smaller things. Like, I mean, he was in, like... Um, I know he's in City Slickers that? as Billy Crystal's yeah. son. 
Yes, that's what I was going to say too. He may have had smaller roles and things. I mean, didn't his dad dir- didn't his dad direct City Slickers? Yeah, he sure. uh, his dad did a few Canadian. I think his dad's Canadian, and like he did a few uh, movies. I think he was more of a cinematographer, but still, yeah, he was already. Yeah, in the I was business. gonna say he might have been the director of cinematography for that instead. But um, anyway, yes, I do think that this was his like legit first starring role. Um, and Josh, he was in Josh and Sam. He was in Homegrown. Have you seen Josh and Sam? Things. I've always been curious about this. Have I seen it? I mean, maybe, but I don't remember much about it. The guy, uh, the main, the older brother in Josh and Sam has gone on, and he is one of the creators and writers for the TV series Letter Penny. Oh, okay. So, okay. Like, quite a bit. But um, if, I ha- if I saw it, I don't really remember it. Maybe we should revisit that later. Yeah. Anyway. It's a, it's yeah, a hell so of a start, though, isn't it? Role. What? It's a hell of a start. Yes, absolutely. And, um, yes, that's the thing is, like, you know, I remember, uh, I, I vividly remember the first time we watched this movie and we watched it together and we were both, like, I would dare say we were both, I don't know if weeping is, might be too dramatic, but we definitely were both, like, crying because this movie is very moving. And in the, I mean, this came out in 1999, thus... Uh, began my 20 year obsession uh, interest uh, love of Jay Gyllenhaal that all started back with this movie I, I can't even tell you how many times I have seen this movie and watching it again last week still fucking cried doesn't matter seen it 15 times at least still wow. yeah I think it's only the second time cried. I've seen it you only, this is only the second time you haven't seen it since the first time you watched it. I really, it like I, I really don't. No, I really don't think I have. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, part like I said, part of it is it's like I had a huge crush on Jake Gyllenhaal. Plus, this is a really, really good movie, and also I think this is why one of the reasons why I'm a, a little bit obsessed with the movies of Joe Johnson. Like, um, there's. They're not all the same, but they all have kind of a similar feel to them. Um, you know, especially especially like Captain America and like the Rocketeer. You yeah. know, well, it's there's, there's a that there's a purity feels, to his movies. This optimistic, the world is huge, yeah. and and we should go. We should not be afraid of that. Yeah. Yes. Like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, I believe was his first movie. Then uh, yes. the Rocketeer, um, Jumanji. I feel like there's one in the middle there. Uh, and thank goodness he, he did the live action portions of the Page Master, which I strangely have, don't think I've ever seen. I watched it. It's not very good. It's it's a it's a yeah. Massive... That's probably why I haven't seen yeah. it. He did some Adventures of Young Indiana Jones show and a movie, then Jurassic Park three, yeah. Otago. Wolfman, mm, Wolfman seems very different from the rest of this stuff. Well, the Wolfman is a mess because it was with a different director for a very long time who quit at the last minute. And they needed somebody mm-hmm. who could take it. And he even said himself that he didn't want to take it. But he was absolutely uh... broke. Um, so he did. And I've seen the director's cut. And the director's cut is way better than the, 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 one I, the version I saw in the theaters. And that feels more like his style and I really neutered him and I yeah he did a Captain America there's so many years between his movies yeah well I feel like he's a guy who's always trying to work on his own projects and it just doesn't happen like he it stalls out and he's one of the George Lucas Spielberg kind of that school like he rose up through that doing like uh second unit footage and special effects and stuff like that Uh and I think, like, what is this? Uh, Stephen <gasps> Summers, the the guy who did the Mummy, oh, they have sure, these yeah. these huge ideas, but they take so many years to move that it can just yeah. get frustrating, and then you just become a gun for hire because you realize you haven't worked in seven years and you need money. I mean, just like everybody else, so I am not going to blame him. Yeah, this is one of the few hey, movies yeah, you though can't that's. Blame him. Yeah. This is one of the few that 
isn't an event movie. You know, the, he was coming off of Jumanji and using that power to get something like this made, something more authentic and, and real uh, than the silliness that had come before that. And I mean, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna do a big studio movie that maybe you don't particularly care for, that's one of the good reasons. Is hey, if this is a hit, I can use that to make smaller movies. And I wish that he was able to do more of that. I just think that, like, for whatever reason, a lot of his movies tend to be very good, but just don't, and maybe have a a strong cult following, but never, didn't really get the appreciation in, in, in real time. Yeah. There's a lot of directors like that. I feel like Joe Dante, Joe Dante was like that. Huh? I feel like very many people have seen this movie. No, it does seem like it was talked about at the time, and I think it did okay on video, but it didn't get a second life. Like, if you look at yeah. the movies that Jake Gyllenhaal has done around this time, it's kind of surprising that this is the one that was kind of left behind while Bubble Boy and um, <laughs> Bubble Boy and yeah. uh, Donnie Darko are the ones that got a cult following. I, Absolutely. It's, it's, hey, they all have their their time and place but this one is to me the star he it, it's it is everything about it is so good the the acting the the story the, the character the, the casting it's just it feels so authentic yeah well, and i think you know the the connection between the two movies also is the fact that you have a very optimistic dreamer kind of guy who was looking for adventure and then his friend who's more of the down to earth uh introverted but very very good with science and and using those numbers to you know get to their final goal i thought it was nice that they didn't like gloss over the math now the the math of course in (laughs) explorers is complete (laughs) fiction (laughs) because that's not possible to make a sphere like that but you know i i I liked his relationship with was it chris owens from uh angus but that's a guy who really never broke through did he because he's just so unusual looking yeah, he, I mean, he did a lot of things in his teen years, but, you know, more supporting roles. This is probably one of his bigger roles other than Angus. Yeah, well, I mean, I remember he had done Major Pain. He was one of the kids in that. Then Angus, which we got to do on the show sometimes. I love Angus. Yeah, uh, uh-huh. A small part in Black Sheep. And then this. And then all of a sudden after this is when all of a sudden you started seeing him. I think he's even in Can't Hardly Wait before this. Is I mean, there's like 9,000 kids in that movie. Yeah. Yes, he's in that movie. I remember him very, very specifically. Oh, he was the fucking yeah. Shermanator in American Pie. Yeah. Yep. I am not prepared to watch American Pie. I, uh, so... That's okay. I don't... I'd rather not. American Pie feels like a love letter to Porky's, which was a shit film in the first place. And I more prefer, like, Can't Hardly Wait... Uh, because it's more like John Hughes. And if it wasn't for John Hughes, teen movies may still be fumbling around trying to, you know, still being sex comedies only. You know, that's... Ugh. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that there isn't a time and place for American Pie and that I wouldn't watch it, but personally, I'd rather put my efforts and my time into watching stuff with a little heart. Yeah. Or a lot of heart. <laughs> that's that's, that's uh, more valuable to me. The um, has Chris Cooper ever played a nice guy? <laughs> I mean, this is the closest I think he ever gets. But he's still like a fucking raw nail. Yeah, you know that's one of the maybe maybe he has, but he has a type. You know, he has his thing. Um, good actor though. Wow, um, he really makes you feel stuff. That's for sure. Um, I do think it's interesting though that like I mean I guess that he's kind of hit the villain in this story, but he's not really. He's not a bad guy. They don't hate each other. They they really do have some kind of understanding. But I do like I think it's really that scene towards the end when he's just like you know. You're my, you know, basically he's like, are you an idiot? You're my hero. Yeah, but thank like, God. You know, they do have some kind of respect between them. And I did read that that was one of the main things that um, Homer Hickam, his, not beef, but one of the things that he didn't love was it was that depiction of his dad because he said that he really wasn't, like, that gruff and... Um, 
like discouraging to his dreams that he was much more like loving than, yeah. than they depicted him to be. I'm just glad that it wasn't so heavy handed. I was like, if you can read into this, he doesn't have to say you're my hero. Just leave it be and people can figure it out. Oh, thank you for not saying it. Because I expect him to turn around and go, it's you, you know, whatever. And I was like, yeah. we can figure this out as an audience. Don't do it. Oh, thank you. My favorite shot of this movie is one that's also heartbreaking is when he is basically having to give up and they yeah. have the camera going down on him as he's... He's looking up into the camera, into the sky as it's leaving him, as he's going down into the mines. It's, it's, yeah. it's taking away his dream. He's going into his cage of hell and watching his dreams die. I thought that was a brilliant shot. Yeah. And the fact that he, like, just sacrificed and did the one thing on this, God, you know, God's green earth he did not want to do because he didn't want to, to steal his brother's chances either, you know? Yeah. It's like, ah, I'm still curious. I know we're never going to have the answer, obviously, but I'm like, who the fuck stole his first ship? <laughs> his first rocket? That makes me so mad. Well, I don't know. You, you, I mean, yeah, that was super shitty. You're right. But I will say, um, you know, I know I'm kind of bouncing around with this. I'm not, like, talking about it from beginning to end or anything. But, you know, I loved this movie so much that I immediately went and found the book. Yeah. I read the book. There's like, so, and then there's actually other ones that follow him as, you know, basically, you know, you get to see, they tell you at the end of the movie, he, he made it to, to NASA, he made it to work, you know, and, and do the things that he wanted. He never, he never went to space, but he worked for NASA, you know, and, and they all, they all got to go to college and it's just like oh i even have chills just like thinking about it because it's like what are the fucking odds and, yeah you know for that for them that they all got to go to college and, and had it did so many things bigger than what they ever would have imagined but he went to college he he went and ended up working for nasa but there are other books that that go past high school oh. you know and then you can see so i mean if you are curious more curious about what really happened to homer you should read them because they're very good books okay good to know yeah um the scene where they're pulling the ties off of the train track gave me yeah. uh flashbacks to stand by me <laughs> I guess. Yeah, me too. Oh God, yes, terrifying. It was, and I was like, are they gonna try to put it back together? How the thing weighs a ton. How are they gonna put? They got to put the nails in. How are they gonna do it? How are they gonna stop this? And I'm like freaking out. Is one of them gonna get killed? Because I couldn't remember the movie, and yeah. I was flipping out. Yeah, that was a really that was a that was probably the scarier moment of the book, huh? Yeah, oh, uh, of the movie. Yeah, of the movie. Yeah, as I say, I haven't read the book, but um, I'm looking at the writer oh, no, here. I'm sorry. Um, it's very interesting the stuff that Lewis Colick had done before and after this movie. Uh, it started off with a kids' movie called The Dirt Bike Kid with the uh, I can't remember his name. It's from the Christmas Story. Um, but then all of a sudden, like seven years later, it does these like real serious dramas. Unlawful Entry, one of my favorites, Judgment Night. Um, oh, then, the screen, the screenwriter. Yeah, uh, yeah. Bulletproof uh, with that comedy with uh, Sandler and Wayans. Ghosts of Mississippi, Dante's Peak, October Sky, Along Came a Spider, Hardball. I mean, those are wildly different movies. A lot of these. That's he, a decent amount of stuff that is also based on books. Yeah, a lot of it though, it looked, it, he wasn't credited, so he was just brought in to like you know punch it up. But he did Domestic Disturbance, yeah. Beyond the Sea, Ladder Forty Nine, and it looks like his last movie was Charlie St. Cloud, which I have never seen. It's just a so-so teen thing. It's like one of those. Um, what is, what's the notebook guy? Nicholas Sparks kind of movies? Is it a Nicholas Sparks movie? It is not, but it feels very much like one. Oh, okay. Um, not much else I have to say about this. I just think it's a truly wonderful drama, period piece, true story. Uh, be ready for no visual dynamite. <laughs> it is not a... It is a very drab, dull, sad town, but it's necessary. So don't expect some visual dynamics from uh, Joe Johnston. Yeah, they, no had, they had to create... A, a vibe and they, they they created I mean you know they did it right yeah um and make your soul hurt a little bit it's it's funny is 
I don't know if I've ever seen a movie set in Pennsylvania that was uh, sunny. <laughs> I think, dude, I think this was in, it takes place in West Virginia. Is it West Virginia? I thought it was in I'm Pennsylvania. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, no, you're know, right. Really you're right. Coal mines in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Boy, those are some accents, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> but, they're the, but they feel more authentic than most accents I've heard in movies. Like yeah. that lady who plays his mom, I'm just like, like that's her. Like this is if she plays any other role ever, I w- couldn't ever pick her out unless she had the same accent. Okay, so yeah, it, it is West Virginia. I apologize. I'm wrong. It's okay. I just I remembered that, but also I just don't think that coal mines are something that is in Pennsylvania. I think it is mostly like Virginia, West Virginia. It's a pretty small area of okay. the United States that actually does those sorts of things. Where do they get steel? Where do they find steel? Is it just in the ground? I'm stupid. Okay, just I'm I was born yesterday. I'm a moron. I- are they digging it that don't out of mines too? Things. I don't know. How do they get steel? They melt it down and then, like from rocks that they dig up. I don't understand anything. I'm stupid. Hey, you're smart enough to Google it, dude. Yeah, I know. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, it's just like, is there? Are there, I mean, there have to be some mines. Just maybe it's not coal mines in Pennsylvania, but steel mines, I guess. Something <laughs> Pennsylvania. Um. I did also think, like, it's kind of a small role for Laura Dern. Was this at, like, a point where she wasn't... I mean, she was... Wasn't this after Jurassic Park? I oh, mean, yeah. It just seems like such a small role for her... For her kind of level of... fame. I, I don't but, know. Like, I mean, but if it's a good role and you don't, it's not too demanding time wise. Like they probably could shoot that in a week. You know, all of her stuff, and she's like, yeah, okay. I'm not. I'm not saying it's beneath her. I just was just curious. Yeah, I. She seemed like pretty, pretty well known actress to play such a small part. Yeah, and I, I'm, I mean, I guess also he used her. I remember she is in a very brief moment of Jurassic Park three. Which I think is the most yeah. underrated of the Jurassic Park movies, the lowest uh, box office. But I think the third one's pretty great. And um, I actually had only watched it like last year for the first time ever. Oh, okay. What'd you think of it? I mean, it had some silly moments, but it was okay. Yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was one of those where like, oh, you're just throwing away the franchise now. And that was the end of it for a long yeah. time. But I thought Joe Johnston did a very good job with it. I mean, there's only only so many things you can do with uh, dinosaurs as proven by the last entry. It's like, your guys have kind of tapped this one out. It's like Jaws. There's only so many things you can do with a shark. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, so anything else you want to say before we go? Um, I do not know, but I definitely think that if, if people have not experienced this, like, yes, be prepared for it to be, you know, a little dark and bleak. Um, but there's, you know, it's a very hopeful film, despite that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, it's just solid for me. It's, uh, I, yeah, no complaints, no, oh, I wish they had done this. Like, just solid casting, well-written, well-directed, very moving film. All right, so yeah. that is it for this episode. Uh, you know where we can find you can find us anywhere on the social media podcast hosts, whatevers, and uh, have a good night. <laughs>